Yes, I don't believe it either, but my new PC is at last done. Well, sort of. Want to customize your Windows 10 desktop wallpaper and look as you please and also get rid of that annoying watermark in the right bottom corner of your screen? Visit GoodOffer24 and use my promo code TACTIC for a discounted genuine Windows 10 license and activate your Windows today for good with a cheaper offer. Hi guys, Matthew here and welcome back again to my channel. After finishing my extensive Air CPU coolers for ITX builds comparison, feel free to check that video out later on, I was finally able to use one of those coolers for my personal build in this 3Coms DA2 ITX chassis, so I wanted to transfer over some of my experiences with it and of course also share with you this build. Oh yeah, for all of you interested in the 10700K undervolting, I will put a timestamp in this video so you can just jump over to that part. So, touching the topic of the CPU, yes, inside we have Intel's Core i7-10700K, 8-core 16-thread CPU with integrated graphics and quick sync technology, which is something I really want to explore going further since I use Adobe's Premiere Pro for editing my videos. Be sure to stick around and subscribe for that too, especially because I'm also planning to do a comparison with my old system based on the Core i7-5960X as well as the Ryzen 7 3700X. Technically speaking, I'm not completely finished with this whole build, this is going to be a series. First and foremost we have this, then I will do some extensive performance testing alongside a few other upgrades, like for example those new DA2 v2 version add-ons which were just recently introduced, redoing some cooling around it and changing the graphics card. So the first video is going to be a rundown of the components and undervolting the Core i7-10700K on MSI's Z490i Unify ITX motherboard hiding under a pretty beefy Be Quiet Dark Rock TF cooler which was one of the top performer both noise and cooling wise in that aforementioned testing plus it actually fit into the DA2 chassis with just enough clearance for the graphics card. Speaking of it, building in the DA2 was really fun and completely different from what I usually experience, firstly because it uses this modular rail system and secondly because it's really beautifully crafted while also being practical, which is why I went for it. Although it's a small ITX chassis in question, it's not super small like the Ghost S1 or Den A4, so there's plenty of room on your disposal. After all, it can handle a standard ATX power supply if it has to, alongside of a possibility to put in some 3.5 inch drives too. The biggest issue for my setup was the 2.5 slot tall Sapphire's RX 5600 XT Pulse model, which took some convincing to get it into the chassis. This will be resolved with me putting a GTX 1660 Super into it, as this Sapphire card is currently a stand-in until I swap the GeForce card from my current system. I find the GTX 1660 Super plenty strong enough for my rendering needs, most importantly because of the CUDA technology which improved rendering time greatly with the latest Premiere Pro updates, and it runs cool and quiet, while my plan down the line is to put a two-slot version of the RTX 3070 or 3060 once it comes out, possibly with some deshrouding and custom fan cooling put beneath them, which can be mounted using those rails. Yes, I know the cable management is not the best, but the plan is to get some custom cables to make everything better and more clean looking. Thankfully, there is not a lot of them to begin with, since I don't use any 2.5 or 3.5 inch drives. As for now, most of them are pretty much out of sight and blocked by this Noctua's NF12X15 fan, which I was actually also looking to fit above the Dark Rock TF cooler as an exhaust fan, but there's just not enough clearance because of the heat pipes. I'm looking into maybe modifying the fan's mounts, make it a bit less thick, but it also seems that the DA2 V2 version could solve this as it provides mounting options on the fan filter itself. Like this, this extra side 120mm fan is additionally cooling off Seasonic's SGX 650W SFX L modular power supply, which by the way has a passive fan running mode, so keeping it cool will prolong the potential activation of its fan, as well as bringing in more fresh air for the CPU cooler and motherboard components. I also used a single 90mm NFA9 X14 fan as an exhaust fan on the back, while I had to ditch the second middle fan of the Dark Rock TF cooler because it interfered with the chassis power supply socket and cable, something 3Com also worked on with the V2 version of the DA2. 
For storage I went with an M.2 only setup, which is why I was in search for a 2 M.2 slot Z490 chipset based ITX motherboard, plus this one doesn't have any of the small winding fans, but still has a very decent power delivery system and passive cooling, which is being blown over with the CPU cooler's fan in my case, and you still get a lot of clearance around the CPU socket for a big air CPU cooler like this one. The only thing I had to adapt a bit was the fitting of the backplate, where I had to go with two plastic washers in each corner to raise it up a bit from the PCB, because in two corners, next to the mounting holes, we had a lot of small SMD components, so I couldn't screw the backplate down because that would probably damage them. Anyhow, back to the SSDs. In this, I will have a 2 1TB setup using Kingston's KC2500 NVMe M.2 SSDs. For now, I didn't do any of the RAID configurations, nor I think I will. Maybe I will do a RAID one with them if I eventually get an external SSD storage array. As for their temperatures, they seem to be okay below 50 degrees Celsius. I still have to test them long term. I will report back onto this and everything else surrounding them in a future video performance in particular, but since the one on the motherboard has its own heatsink and it has some air going over it from the CPU cooler's fan, and since the back one has plenty of room to breathe, plus they are also not PCI Express 4.0 drives, I don't think high temperatures will be a problem. Besides the build itself, for now I wanted to focus on finding a good balance between really silent operation and CPU temperatures because that's the only thing, together with the memory, which is currently not going anywhere in terms of the future modifications that I mentioned earlier. This is why I want to show you the whole process of undervolting the 10700K and tweaking it in that regard, which ended up being pretty straightforward. Right off the bat I fixed its frequency at 4.7 GHz, I've actually tried going to 4.8 GHz, but the difference in voltage needed between it and the 4.7 GHz was just not worth the temperature increase in my opinion. In the end, I managed to get stable clocks for that frequency with only 1.175 volts set for the core's voltage. I didn't fiddle too much around the rest of the settings, it wasn't really necessary. I've set the AVX CPU ratio offset to 0, put the LCC to MSI's mode 3, fix the CPU ratio to 47 and ring ratio to 44, load up the XMP profile of the memory and that was pretty much it. Since I'm using here a 2x32GB HyperX Fury RAM kit that runs at pretty modest 3200MHz, and since I undervolted and not overclocked my CPU, I went with pretty low SA and IO CPU voltages, just below the default values, which made things a bit cooler. I eventually ended up being below 85 degrees Celsius on basically all cores in one hour long Cinebench R20 run, with occasional peaks just above that, and averages mostly closer to 80 degrees Celsius. I found this result to be more than okay considering how compact this chassis is, but that's probably thanks to a lot of perforated breathable points found basically on every panel of it. I've also tweaked the fans profile a bit, they are actually not running at full speed to achieve those kind of temperatures, so there's more headroom in regards of that for sure. Here is how that sounds when the CPU is under full load during Cinebench runs and during system idle, together with the sound measurement device. Of course, all of this can differ depending on the silicon lottery, your cooler and chassis setup, but I'm happy for now and I can't wait to finish everything so I can put it in use for good. I will maybe play with the per core configuration later on and other settings, so if you have any info or feedback to give, please do so in the comment section down below. That's it for this time and for this first part of this series, the next one is going to come pretty shortly after, and until then, thank you once again for watching. Please take a second to toss me a thumbs up if you enjoyed my content, that really helps a lot. And if you like what you saw, feel free to subscribe and if you already are, be sure to press that notification bell down below so you don't miss out on a new video.
Until then, catch you later, guys.